Now imagine that your life is like, there's a computer simulation of your life, a, an RPG game, third person RPG game, that contains all the outcomes of every decision you can possibly make in your life. I'd like to welcome to the show, Anthony Peake. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing well, very well, Alex. Great to be chatting to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. I'm excited to talk to you because your your research is fascinating to me. And uh, well, first, my very first question is, how did you get into this, this line of research? Like what made you go, hey, you know, life and death, let's prove it. <laughs> life wow. after death, let's prove it. <laughs> I guess because it's the biggest question of all, isn't it? You know, it is. You know, we're, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was always used to think, what the hell is the point of all this? You know, why am I here? What's the whole point of it? And even as a nine and 10 year old, I became fascinated by um, esoteric phenomena. I came quite fascinated by out of body experiences, near death experiences, these kind of things. And I had the opportunity of buying a part, a UK part work called Man, Myth and Magic. This was in the late 1960s. It was probably earlier, probably even earlier than that, I think. And um the the part work really in, made me very interested in extraordinary human experiences. So when I had the opportunity to go to university, um, I decided that I would focus my attentions on the sociology of religion, the sociology of belief, and also the, the sociology of ideas. Um, and also I focus in also on uh, religious movements, and particularly historical ones during the 15th, 16th century. So I was quite interested in that as well. Um, but I then carried on, you know, did postgrad at the London School of Economics and went into business um, as, a, as a business manager. But all through my life, I'd always wanted to write books on extraordinary experiences. And I became heavily involved in the UFO phenomenon, abductions, everything else. Um, but it was way back in 1999, I had the opportunity. Um, I'd, I'd done a business contract out in Poland and I'd, I'd earned sufficient money to take a year out to write a book. And my wife was very understanding. She said, well, if you want to do it, just do it. Take the year out, take a sabbatical and just write the book. So really, literally, I started on the first day writing the book. And I was sitting there and I thought, what the hell am I going to write about? You know, you're, you're a writer. You've got this blank piece of paper in front of you, or the, the blank screen. And what happened was I, I suddenly started sensing I was going to come down with a migraine attack. Um, and my fingers started going numb. It happens to me a lot. My fingers start numb. My lips start to go numb. And then I had the most extraordinary deja vu sensation that I'd sat in front of that computer screen, the blank computer screen, thinking about writing a book. And I thought, that's it. I'll write a book about deja vu because that is such a common phenomenon. I've had it all my life. It's associated with my classic migraine. So I started after I came out of the aura state because I never get a headache. I don't get the headache. I just get this kind of feeling of disassociation. And I started researching it. And I was amazed to discover the massive links between neurologically between near-death experiences and deja vu and migraine. They're all linked. They're all to do with the same neurochemicals in the brain. And I then discovered, much to my astonishment, that also linked to this is, is something called temporal lobe epilepsy which is a, a particularly powerful form of epilepsy where people go into altered states of consciousness. They have their own effective DMT trips. And all of these, both um, migraine, classic migraine, temporal lobe epilepsy, they're all linked by one thing. And that's linked um, to the fact that they all have aura states and most of the aura states involve deja vu sensations. And that's how it started. And we'll get into the material in the book, but what, really was extraordinary was that, um, and I'll tell you a very quick story about this, because um, I was still doing business contracts. I get phone calls from people occasionally from management consultants wanting me to work for other companies. And I get this phone call one afternoon from this lady who was working for an, an agency. And she said, hi, Tony, how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing fine. And she said, I've got a business contract for you if you're interested. And I said, well, I've decided to take a year out to write a book. So I'm not really interested in doing this. And she said, well, what do you want? What are you writing about? And I said, well, I'm writing about altered states of consciousness and I'm particularly interested in temporal lobe epilepsy. And she went really quiet and she said, oh, OK, can we meet up? So I met her for coffee. Um, uh, we have a local airport here, Gatwick Airport, and I met her for coffee at the airport or a hotel near the airport. And she sat me down and she said, the reason I, we needed to speak to you was that um, 
I was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy about three, three or four months ago. Jeez. And she said the things she was saying were resonating with me. And she told me how she first came across temporal lobe epilepsy. And this is extraordinary. She said she was sitting at a business meeting with, uh, with, a, with another lady. And the lady was about to pour a cup of tea. And as she did so, my associate, I call her Margaret, that's not a real name. She felt a snap over her ear. And she said she looked and her friend had stopped moving. And she goes, what the hell is going on here? And then she could hear this low humming sound around her. And then she looked closer and she could see that her friend was actually moving really slowly. And she told me though, and she actually said, and it was quite profound, she said, I felt that I was there for days, months, years, watching this tea come out the teapot, fall out the teapot, hit the surface and plunk and come down. And then she said, after what seemed like a lifetime, I felt another click over my ear and the lady went back and just looked at me. And she'd been away for about, she'd gone blank for around about two seconds. And that's what's called a petty mal absence uh, in, 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 in neurological terminology. And the person in the, they go into this altered state of consciousness where time dilates. And this was, and I turned around to her and I said to her, do you get deja vu sensations? And she said, oh, I get, I get the most extraordinary deja vu sensations. I know what's going to happen for the next minute. And I subsequently met somebody else who also had um, a, a um, tumor on his pineal gland. And he said the same thing. And I asked him and I said, if you know what's going to happen next, why don't you say something? And he said, think about it. He said, if I turn around and say, you're about to say something to me, and I butt in and go, I've just had a deja vu sensation. I know what you're going to say. You'll say something different. So he said, I'd change the future. And <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over uh, cold. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that there's something curious taking place in the brain during these seizures. And I then subsequently found out that very similar chemicals are released when people have near-death experiences. And that's how I had my whole idea for the book. And they, as they say, the rest is history because I wrote the book. I didn't have a publishing deal. Um, and then I sent the book off to a publishers in London and quite by chance. And again, I'm fascinated by luck and synchronicity. I call it synchronicity. Mm -hmm. The idea that you get coincidences that are helpful. What happened was that the the uh, the managing at the chief executive of the publishing company was flying over to New York for a meeting, and on his desk were a load of manuscripts that had been sent in, and mine was one of them. And he just picked mine up at random, and he flew to New York and he read it in the flight. And when he landed at um, at um, JFK, the first thing he said was, "He phoned back. We've got to get this book. <coughs> we need to get this book from this guy." And the book was published in 2006, which was this one here. Um, and that's now sold, what, 60,000 copies worldwide. It's into every every major European language and a lot of minor ones. Um, so it's done phenomenally well. Um, and what it does is it presents a model of life after death that's based on science not based on anything other than a description of people when they have near-death experiences, what does it mean? And I then go into the neurology, the quantum physics. I mean, real quantum physics. I don't mean new age quantum physics. I mean, the real deal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I make it my business to really understand Schrodinger's equations and such like. So, so it's scientifically based. So <clears throat> everything in my books is based on science. So when you read my books, Everything is cross-referenced to academic papers. I very much work upon the principle that a guy called Marcello Trui, who was a, uh, an Italian skeptic, said, extraordinary claims need ex demand extraordinary proofs. And I work on that objective, that if I say something in my books that seems strange, I give my reader the opportunity to go and read it up themselves and go to the papers and read it up. So that's basically it, how I got into it. Wow, it's it's fascinating. I'm 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 also fascinated by very, pretty much everything you are fascinated by. So I love, you know, I love the esoteric aspects of you know ancient teachings and the book of the you know the Tibetan Book of the Dead and yeah. and you know and in the Hinduism and Jainism and going deep into the ancient texts of the Vedas and things like that, where you start hearing a lot about these kind of concepts, which are a little bit more nebulous and there's not a lot of proof per se. 
But then this, how science, and I've had multiple neuroscientists on, quantum physicists on, talking about how the science is starting to catch up to the spirituality. Yeah. And they're trying to, they're starting to intersect where they're now it's getting to a point where you can't like your work, you can't really argue anymore about no, certain things. Absolutely. You can't. And this is the interesting thing. When I do lectures and talks and I've, I've talked in America, Australia, various other places, my argument is always that you look at the science, you look at the quantum physics and you look at the work of people like, I give an example, Max Tegmark, mm. who's Princeton university, I think. And Tegmark has what he calls the quantum suicide experiment, where he uses quantum physics to prove of, prove immortality. And the interesting thing is he uses exactly the same information I use for my model. And indeed in my latest book, which is my 12th, which is this one, which came out yeah. January last year. Um, in this one, no, it was the summer this year, sorry. In this one, I use Tegmark's arguments because he uses Everett's many worlds interpretation, which of course you'll be aware of. Mm -hmm. And he applies that to the observer effect, the idea that we collapse the potentiality of the wave function into a point particle in one location or another from a statistical wave to a point particle existing in time and space. And if you look at the quantum physics and what the quantum physics is actually telling us, rather than being doctrinaire about it, the evidence is there, it's in plain sight. You know, and everybody, when they come across my work for the first time, I do a lot of these interviews and I always find it extraordinary that people interview me and they'll suddenly go, oh my God, I see where you're coming from here. And suddenly it all makes sense. And over my 12 books, you know, I've developed the idea. I've written, written a book with Irvin Laszlo. Um, oh yeah. I love and that. I mean, <clears throat> Irvin, for instance, he contacted me um, and said, he wanted to write a book with me on my ideas. And he invited me down to do a talk with him down in Italy a few years ago, which was astonishing, amazing experience. But we all, it, and we've got to apply, as you rightly said, we've also got to discuss the mystical tradition. We've also got to discuss, like you mentioned, the Book of the Dead, the, the Bardo. Oh. And the Bardo state is exactly what I describe. I describe that at the point of death, we go into this timeless place and we live our lives again. And we live our lives again. Not, not we don't reincarnate. You're reborn as Alex Ferrari with the same parents. Mm. <clears throat> but you have the opportunity to change that life, just like Connors does in the movie Groundhog Day. Because of course in Groundhog Day, every day is different to him. So what I find fascinating about your work is that you're you're now getting to be able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that there is life after death. Can you explain, which I found fascinating about something you had said earlier, what is the chemical that is released in the brain when there's a near-death experience? I've heard and spoken to all the the leading experts in near death, Raymond Moody, all those all those people. I've never heard anyone talk about the chemical makeup of what happens to you. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is so important. People tend to, when you read books on near-death experiences, what you get is a series of anecdotes. Right. You never get explanations. Uh, you get, it happened to me, which is fascinating and it's interesting. But we need to understand the neurological correlates of what's taking place here. Now, in my initial model, I argued the facilitator was a neurotransmitter called glutamate. And glutamate is the major neurotransmitter of the mammalian brain. Now, it is known that at the point of death, there's something called the glutamate flood, which is literally is a massive release of glutamate across the brain, which causes something called excitotoxicity, which means the brain starts to, to excrete other chemicals to protect itself. And I believe, initially, I initially believed it was the release of these chemicals that brought about the altered state of consciousness and the hallucinations in raised commas that involved near-death experience, such as, you know, feeling you're outside of your body, because I've written a book on out-of-body experience as well, so there's a similarity there. The feeling that time is dilating, and what's called the, the panoramic life review. These are all the moody traits, you know, as you, you've, you've interviewed Ray, so you'll know about the moody traits. But as I developed and I started writing more and more books, and I was speaking to more and more scientists, more and more neurologists, and more and more researchers, I came to the conclusion, it could be glutamate, 
but it also could be endogenous dimethyltryptamine. Okay, DMT. And I argue that in the, my latest book, I argue that what takes place at the point of death is that the pineal gland starts excreting endogenous DMT, internally generated DMT. And what it does is it synthesizes from um, melatonin, which is the reason the pineal gland, what it does is it sits just above the, the optic chiasma. So the, 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 the nerve, the eyes, when it goes into the brain, the optic nerve goes down and it crosses and it, directly above it is the thing called the pineal gland. Mm. You know, the pineal gland is light sensitive and it exists initially, they believed, to realize that when the pineal gland realizes it's going dark because it realizes there's less activity in the, the, the optic nerve, it starts generating melatonin, which is what makes us go to sleep. But there's, there's more research to be suggested now than it does something more than that. It also starts releasing, releasing what we call, or what the researchers I work with call metatonin, which is internally generated DMT. Now, if this is the case, we've then got an interesting area because this means that the hallucinations that people have when they have uh, near-death experiences are not dissimilar in many ways to the hallucinations brought about by DMT trips. Now, again, I'm working with um, a number of researchers in Imperial College in London who are doing research into DMT. They're actually taking DMT intravenously under control conditions. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing when they do that, they have out-of-body experiences, they experience entities. Um, the entities seem to know they're coming. The entities seem to remember them from last time. And one of my associates... He told me that uh, he took the DMT under control conditions, found himself in what's called the DMT cage, which is a kind of a location in space time. And he said this, this alien entity came over to him and, and podded, prodded him on his shoulder and said, you shouldn't be doing this this way. This is wrong. And he said he then came back into his body. And two weeks later, he had the DMT again. He was in exactly the same place and exactly the same alien came over and said to him again, I told you last time, this is not how you should do it. So they're starting to believe that whichever space we go into when we're in DMT trips, it's real. It's more real than this reality. This is the illusion. This is the hallucination. And then we get to the point, you know, well, what do we mean when we say hallucinations? You know, effectively, everything we perceive is an hallucination created by the brain. The brain presents information to us from the senses. So it's a chemical thing. But it's more than that. It's more complex than that. And when we're in these, these altered states of consciousness, we can perceive different elements of reality, different... I hate to use the term dimensions because I know enough about physics and the mathematical physics and topology to know that when we talk about dimensions, it's slightly more complex than that. But we do seem to go into an alternate state where we can perceive a broader level of reality. And I call, in one of my books, I have this idea that depending upon our neurological state is how much of reality we can perceive. And I call it the Huxleyan spectrum after Aldous Huxley. And I wrote a book called Opening the Doors of Perception four years ago, which discusses this. And remember I mentioned about people who have temporal lobe epilepsy, people who have uh, migraine, schizophrenia who have quite schizophrenia people who have autism all these people their perceptual field is wider than ours and they perceive the kind of reality behind the reality the reality that is part of the place you go when you have a near-death experience now again rick strassman who you will probably know about the the guy that did the definitive research on dmt at the university of new mexico mm -hmm. in the 1990s rick actually argues that DMT is our reality modulator. It's DMT that creates the external illusion that we live within. Now, again, in my new book, Cheating the Ferryman, I not only argue that, but I do the science that this is a simulation. And I do the science of how the simulation works. So unlike a lot of other writers, every area, I believe I can explain every single weird experience that anybody can have, from poltergeists to ghosts, to telekinesis, to telepathy, to out-of-body experiences, to near-death experiences. My model explains it all completely and utterly, starting starting point of science.
So, okay, so, I mean, this is just so fascinating to me. All right, so you're basically saying, we were talking about simulation theory, and that the, we're talking about many things, but one thing you're talking about simulation theories and that this is illusion, and that we create this illusion with our minds, which is what Hindus have been saying yeah, Maya. for Maya for like 5,000 years at this point. So that's, again, when the old and the new are coming together and in multiple cultures, even in the American Indian culture and the native American cultures, um, Aborigine cultures, all of them. This is the great dream, the illusion. This is a concept that's been in our zeitgeist, this concept for a long time, but now we're just catching up with the science, which is uh, again, the matrix. I use the, the matrix, but you know, we're basically, yeah. that was the it first is. time it, it's the matrix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you're, you're able to see beyond what is normally perceived and there is this and then i've talked to exper experts about the flow being in the flow where mm -hmm. all of the things that you're talking about happen time slows down yeah. everything becomes clear you're able to to perceive things that you wouldn't normally perceive when you fall into the flow athletically or creatively or in science or wherever when you're focused there's these altered states and it all goes back down to altered states it's fascinating. It, it sounds to me from what you're talking about is that you've now been able to explain not only the altered state of near-death experience, which you believe now, based on the science, that the person does go somewhere else. It's not a, a delusion. It's not a, a dream state. It is, no, we're in the dream state. We're actually going to the real state, if you will. Does that yeah. make sense? Like, we're waking yeah. up from this to go to where we're at. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so important that we, I, I spend a lot of time discussing when we use the term hallucination, what we actually mean. And if you turn around and look, read the books on the science of hallucinations, what you'll find is that scientists and neurologists have no idea what a hallucination is. Not at all. I mean, um, the, the world famous uh, psychiatrist Oliver Sacks, the last book, book he wrote was uh, Hallucinations. And in my in his book, as in my book, I'm fascinated by things such as Charles Bonnet syndrome, where people who are losing their sight start seeing people in three dimensions out in three dimensional space, including my own mother. And in fact, on my own podcast, I've interviewed two or three people that have Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. You know, they see little people. You know, again, elves, you know, again, one of the areas I'm fascinated in, you know, what is what is the role of aliens? What what are greys, really? Mm. This kind of thing. And again, the hypothesis says that the greys are actually denizens of this liminal space that's between this reality and the next reality. And again, I go down to the belief systems of things like Gnosticism. You know, the Gnostics believe that there's a reality behind this reality called the Pleroma. And we exist in something called the Kenoma, which is a created world created by what they call the Demiurge, Aldeboth. And we're trapped within it. Of course, this is a central thesis of the Matrix movies, you know. Oh, yeah. But what is even more important is now we're now doing the science. So we know that there's a massive area of research being done at the moment on the holographic universe and the idea oh, that everything yeah. we exist is within is a holographic simulation. But again, I do the science of this and I quote, for instance, I have an extensive section quoting and, and looking at the last paper that Stephen Hawking wrote about black holes. It's to do with black holes. It's to do with information. It's to do with how black holes process information. We are in an information field. This is, this is a data field that we're, that we're within. I also argue that we also have our programming within ourselves, within our DNA. DNA itself, the codons of DNA, mm -hmm. the four letters of DNA are part of the encoding. And I sometimes feel that it's like I've got all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And all I need to do is to get a group of really good thinkers together, spend a weekend and thrash this all out and make real sense of it. Because it does make sense. Now, if and if it is a simulation, we've then got to come down to, well, who creates the simulation? you know, is the simulation being designed in some way? Um, if it has, it's what for what purpose? And it all then becomes very interesting because I argue that what is, because one of the areas of my theory we haven't discussed yet 
because there's so much of it. I can talk for hours. Oh yeah, no. But there's the idea that we are all dual personalities. We're all we're all two creatures. I call it the Edelon and the Daemon. Now imagine that your life is like your there's a computer simulation of your life, a, a, an RPG game, third person RPG game that contains all the outcomes of every decision you can possibly make in your life. You get born and you're an on-screen sprite. So what you do is, now in my generation, I used to play Tomb Raider. So imagine Tomb Raider. Raider. You start Tomb Raider up, there's Lara Croft. She's born for the first time. She has no history, no past. She doesn't remember what she is. She just knows she's existing in this environment. She runs down a corridor, goes into a room as a big monster, and it kills her. She goes back to the start of the game. She's dead, but she comes back to the start of the game. And there's a new version of her, a new sprite created in a new game. I call the on-screen sprite the Edelon. This is, again, from Gnosticism. This is a Gnostical term. The Edelon is the, the facsimile person. However, what's now happened is there's a game player who has witnessed the first incident where she gets killed by the monster, and it suddenly is aware of itself and realizes that it can guide its in-game avatar, and that's the daemon. And what the daemon does is it plays the game of your life. And it tests and allows you to follow every path you can possibly follow in your life in order to explore. So the daemon is that being inside of you. And I guarantee you've had it. And I'll guarantee a lot of your listeners have had it. You know, when you get that sensation, you meet somebody and you go, Ooh, not too sure about you. There's something here that's not right. That's your daemon. Mm. It's your daemon going, last time this person was a problem. Now, depending upon how far you are along my Huxleyan spectrum is how effective your daemon can communicate. I have an associate of mine, for instance, <laughs> uh, Myron Dial, who's a Californian artist. His daemon manifested when he was four years old, has been with him all his life. Yeah. She's, he, she's called Caron, and she's lived daemon's, uh, Myron's life before and guides him. I also wrote a book on the American science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, specifically because Philip K. Dick had so many experiences that, are, that that I can explain through my hypothesis, including predicting me, which is really weird. This is this is this will blow your mind. Do you, you know Philip K. Dick? Yeah, of course. Okay. The Blade Runner. Yeah. Okay. He wrote a book called um, Martian Time Slip. Mm-hmm. Was it Martian Time Slip? I'm, you know, I'm tired at the moment. I think it was Martian Time Slip. Um, and in in the novel. No, Counterclock World. It's Counterclock World. In Counterclock World, he has a character that um, comes up with a new theory about life after death and does lots of ideas about these kind of things. Now, he could have called that person anything in the world, couldn't he? He called him Anarch Peak. That is so <laughs> wild. And when I wrote the book on Philip K. Dick, I said, just imagine if Philip K. Dick could see his own future, an old alternative future, and he'd seen a bookcase. And he'd seen my book on him and he'd just seen my name on it. You know, do I necessarily believe that? I'm not necessarily sure, but it is. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun to think about. What, and what, go on, sorry. Let, let me stop you for a second because you said something really interesting. The, the, the daemon, is it called? Daemon, yeah. Daemon. Okay, so the daemon sounds to me, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me that it could be interpreted as a soul. Some oh, yeah. con- or consciousness. Yeah. Something that's driving, something that is aware of itself. Yes. And is in, so on the mystical standpoint, it could be a soul, it could be consciousness. And then what I found, re- I smiled when you said it because it was so profound, but it just went right by really quickly. And I want to stop and go back to it. You said, the more times it's lived, the better it can navigate this avatar or daemon. Um, uh, you know, uh, not the, or the, 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 Edelon, the, Edelon, Edelon. Yes, the, the Edelon's life, yeah, the yeah. body. So the Edelon is the body. The daemon is the soul. Let's just, for, for, for lack of a better word to say. Yes. And the more that it plays, the better it can work it, which goes completely with what Hindus have been talking about in regards to ascended masters. Yes. Because ascended masters have lived multiple lives and have now transcended to the place where they can stop playing the game, and they go, "Oh, I I understand what the truth is. I'm I can now leave. 
I can go and and go to the next level or choose as or an choose. avatar to come back and be be a bodhisattva in right within, exactly within, within Buddhism right or, or yeah and and again with it said in the masters many of them choose to stay and help behind the scenes like you know because I've I've said this to so many near death experiences I'm like Jesus is a busy guy he's yeah. all he's all that I mean he's working constantly well right? funnily, funnily enough to jump in the 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 analogy of the movie Groundhog Day really works here very effectively because I argue that. Connors lives that life. And I interviewed uh, Danny Rubin, who is the guy that wrote the, the original script. And he said he, th he theorized that he would have about 6,000, 7,000 lives. And you remember at the end of the movie, after he's lived the life many times, the day many times, he's running around the town trying to save people. He, right. He's under the tree to catch no, the kid. No, 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 yeah, he's, yeah, become, yeah. he's become a bodhisattva. He's become yeah. a self-aware bodhisattva who's trying to help people. Um, and again, I wrote a book on the British playwright called J.B. Priestley. And Priestley wrote a, an, a, a play in the 1930s called I Have Been Here Before. And that's exactly the central principle. One of the characters is going back into his lives to stop a couple making a terrible error. Very clever. And this makes sense to me because although, you know, I feel that the idea of reincarnation is very beguiling, I don't understand how it can be iterative, how you can grow if you don't remember your past lives, there has to be a part of you that remembers your past lives to yeah. help you grow, but which in Hinduism and within reincarnation, there isn't that model. Right. So there has to be the universal you. And on top of that, I argue, and in my new book, I'm expanding this. I'm quite interested in the concept of pandeism, the idea that we're all one singular consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. Correct. You know, the Bill Hicks thing. Mm -hmm. And what I argue is that there is the Eidolon, which is the in-game that lives one life and then dies, which is you and I at the moment when we're acting normally and everything else. Then there is the daemon that lives your life many, many times. Then there is what I call the Uber daemon, which is the equivalent of the Jungian overself or the Jungian collective unconscious. And that's the, the, whole, the whole memories of the whole of humanity. And that's where reincarnation takes up. That's where past lives become it's because you're tuned you're going past your daemon into the uber daemon and you you're, you're remembering the past lives of the uber daemon which means that suddenly you can remember being henry the eighth or living in victorian yeah. times then i come to the conclusion that and above that is something i call the godamon and the godamon is effectively the collective consciousness of everything now, again, this goes back, doesn't it, to mystical traditions, because, of course, trying to find the daemon is what mystical traditions have been trying to do all the time. You're trying to find your over self, your, your, the soul. your higher self. Yeah, the higher self, now, exactly. And I then argue that if you look at some of the, the, the religious traditions, when you go down to basics, it's something called the, um, the perennial philosophy. Aldous Huxley came up with this idea that all religions have a perennial philosophy at the at its in its mystical core all religions have the same ideas because if you look at teachings of sufism you look at teachings of the gnostics you look at the teachings of um the uh, vedanta um all the major religions they all have the same concept that god is everything and that for instance in judaism you have a concept called the or ein sof Mm -hmm. which is the consciousness of everything. And within uh, within Vedanta, you have the concept of Brahman. Mm -hmm. And we're all, that, we're all dreams of Brahman. So again, the theory, although it's based in science, every single religious tradition, every single mystical tradition, and the amount of mystical groups that have invited me to speak, because they've said, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing the science of what we've believed for years. And they, they get quite astonished. Mm -hmm. And I go, you've, already, you've done it. You've already done it. And I get I get very excited when that happens. And I also get quite frustrated because I really do believe I've put it all together. And it sounds vain. I'm not vain. I'm, I'm an enthusiast. I'm like you. I just mm -hmm. love ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, this may be just hypothetical. And do I genuinely believe it? I don't know. But by God, it works. You know, it explains so many things. Well, and and you said something a few seconds ago too that how can we continue to learn if we don't remember our past lives? Well, Laura Croft doesn't remember. He does spot on. You've got it. She does. But the player, but the player does. 
Yep. You got and, it. and that's, and that's for people, again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring it down to earth for people that might not, might get lost in our conversation is that Laura Croft is who we are. We don't remember that the monsters are around the corner, but my God, the player does. And when we start walking down that hall, I might want to go into that world and there's something that will stop me yeah. and I'll get upset, but I want to go in that door and something is, something is saying, no, 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 this is not good for you. You need to go and it, and it pushes you in another direction. And only after years, you know, of, of living life, do you go back and you go, my God, 45 people died by that monster. If I would have gone into that door, I would have died. Who is watching out for me? Who is, you know, and for 45 other souls, that was that was the moment that they needed to learn there's that monster in that room. But for, for me and for you, we we already learned that lesson and we're moving on. So again, this is the evolution of the soul, the higher, the higher, um, the higher self in in trying to obtain becoming an ascended master and to quit, to have the opportunity to quit the game. When you've now beaten the game. And you can go off, and now you can go off and leave to another, another game, another level of an of a higher level that we don't know about. Or we can stick around, and we could be in the room where all the other players are, and go, okay, here's how you can help here, here, and and give tips along the way. I know, and this is this is I find this amazing that people. People get my hypothesis so wrong, cheating the ferry. And the amount of times people say, I don't want to live my life over and over again. It's terrible. Um, and I point out, just think about it for a second. Think that that encoded within the universe, encoded within the digital information field, which is the universe, there is the outcome of every decision you can possibly make. And again, that's not a statement I'm making. That That is the top-down hypothesis of, of, of Stephen Hawking and Frank ha um, Hawking and Hartle. Oh, Thomas Hertog, sorry. So it's something that, that you know, it fits in with, with physics. But you've got to extrapolate this and say, hold on a minute. If you think about it, it means that not only is it every outcome of every decision you can make that you can experience, but the decisions, your life and how you've lived your life is also dependent upon the decisions of your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. So in which case, in, in the multiverse... Every possible scenario that can happen will happen to you. And again, uh, there's a very famous British writer, British science writer called Brian Cox. And I did an event with Brian Cox's PhD tutor many years ago at the National Gallery in London. And he argues that, and the book title actually says, anything that can happen will, everything that can happen will happen. So when people turn around and say, but isn't it your idea terrible because so, a child could be born with a congenital illness be in agony for six months and die. And that will happen over and over again for all eternity for that child. Mm -hmm. I would argue no, because that child has been born into that situation in your universe, in your perceptual field. But in that child's perceptual field, there will be a universe that that child will be born in where they found a cure for that disease. Because all diseases are genetic in basis. And that child will exist in that universe and live a normal life. What so... But but the thing is this, that what you just said is, it is so interesting because we as humans are attaching a moral, moral uh, judgment. Points, yes. On what's happening, so and I use this, I use this, I use this example all the time. An event happens, it it is what it is. It has no negative, positive. It is only the moralistic point of view that we are programmed with at birth by who we are, our religion, our, our community, our parents, all of this that puts that on. So in our point of view, uh, you shouldn't have slavery, right? As, I, I'm speaking for you. As a general, slavery is bad. It's not something that should have ever happen. Other, But for years, <laughs> centuries, thousands of years, slavery was A-OK. -okay. People who, who wrote my Declaration of Independence who left your country <laughs> were slave owners and it was completely cool with it. That was the moralistic code at that point. Now we look at it as different. So I use this example, a car accident, a fender bender, the person who gets hit and the person in the accident, horrible day. There's a negative associate. It's just an, it's a car accident. 
but we have now attached a negative aspect to that. But when they they um, they tow the car to the mechanic, great day. I got business. Yeah. Same event, two different perspectives. And I would argue, just to butt in very quickly, because it's mm -hmm. quite an important point here that I'll miss if we, we progress too quickly. But the other point here is as well, people turn around to me and say, you know, I'm having a terrible time of it at the moment. My life is awful, I, this, that, and the other. And I'll argue it's because the daemon is positioning you. The daemon needs to position you in certain ways to get you to where it wants to be. Yes. So it might have to put you through all that pain and trauma because it knows ultimately you're going to gain from it. Mm. And it knows because it's planning. It's like a chess game. You know, and, you know, I, I, you know, it, it's planning and it's thinking its way through. Yeah. And indeed, many ways, the daemon might just think, you know what? Last time I didn't marry that person. I'll do it this time just to see what happens. Because that's what you do in computer games, don't you? You'll think, well, Laura Croft, I want us to go down there. I know there's a monster there, but there might be something in the other side of the monster room if I can get her through. And they might try dozens of times to get her through that room. And, you know, dozens of... Adelons will be killed, but ultimately the daemon gets through the room. Um, and that makes life really exciting because it means that, you know, I can do all the things that I've always dreamed of doing and a version of me will do that. I won't remember it, but my daemon will, you know. It is, it is, it is a very interesting way of looking about things. It, again, no, we as, as humans, and correct me if I'm wrong, are programmed to want not to suffer. Yes. We don't want to suffer. We don't want pain. We, we, we want to gain pleasure and avoid pain. It's a general consensus of what we are built to do on us on a biological standpoint. But on a spiritual standpoint, the things that you go through, I mean, I've gone through a lot of things in my, <clears throat> in my life. I've written books about my, my experiences that were traumatic, that, that shaped my life. But looking back, I go, I wouldn't change it because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today without going through that. If I wouldn't have almost made <clears throat> a $20 million movie for the mafia as a film director when I was 26 and then go and meet the biggest movie stars in the world and do the tour of Hollywood and have big meetings and penthouses and, and the Chateau Marmont and all that stuff at 26, wow. while my life is being threatened on a daily basis by a bi bipolar gangster, for a year, I wouldn't have launched my first podcast 10 years later trying to help other filmmakers avoid the pitfalls of our, of, of the filmmaking business. Without that experience, I wouldn't have done that. And then that experience of being a podcaster for seven years made me think about deeper questions and launched this podcast really? where now I am now trying to help people along their path not just as a filmmaker, but as a spirit, as a <clears throat> player of the game, and to talk about these ideas to make things make a little bit more sense on the path. And you know what I'd say here? I'd say that both our lives have had a path that has led to this moment here. Correct. And us having this conversation, and I say this when I do my talks, because it's extraordinary how you find yourself in certain locations and you meet people, we need to talk far more. We've got so much to talk about. We really have, Alex. You <laughs> yes. know, I just know that. Yes. But, you know, the idea of how you just, you you meet people. I'm finding this now, the amount of people that are coming into my life, and they're all coming in for a reason. And it doesn't mean that I'm delusional. It doesn't mean that I'm important or anything else. It just means that we're, we collectively, and I'm including you in this because you clicked. Well, I do a lot of these podcasts and interviews thank you and it's unusual for somebody to get it absolutely get it you know and resonate with it so thank you for that thank you and we we have this group of people and we're all sitting around you know we meet up regularly and we go okay what are we supposed to do <laughs> what what does our daemons want us to do now and it just means that we're, we're gonna we're gonna do something and i don't know what it is i wish i knew but our daemons do and you find all your time that your daemon is is saying, okay, just bear with this. You know, the times are difficult now, but there is a reason for this. And if it's if we are all collective, I argue that we are all existing in our own 
phanerons is a term. Uh, Charles Stuart Pierce, the American philosopher, came up with the term the phaneron because I deal a lot with philosophy. In my new book, I have a whole section on the philosophy of the eternal return or the eternal recurrence, which is effectively what I'm talking about here. Sure, sure. And Pierce was one of the people that was fascinated by this. And he argued that we all collapse. He wouldn't have used collapsing the wave function because it's a quantum physics term. But what he meant was that, you know, we all exist within our own created world and our worlds overlap on other people's worlds when we interface with them. So you and I are now creating what I call an egregorial reality, mm -hmm. because in my last second to last book, the, the hidden universe, I argue that we create the ghosts around us. We create the poltergeist. We create the entities because there's a symbiotic relationship between us and them. You know, like you can create a tulpa, a thought form, but the tulpa becomes independent of you. Um, and again, myself and a, a group of associates are planning to recreate um, the famous Philip experiment from 1970. Mm -hmm. Do you know where a group of people created an entity, no. or created a ghost, mm -hmm. which then became independent of them. And I believe that we create, we, we are co-creating our realities around us mm -hmm. and we overlap and it can get bigger and the egregore gets bigger. You know, I find that when myself and my group meet, the electricity we can create metaphorically is just extraordinary. Well, well let me ask you this, because this is very interesting. You've heard of the concept of vibration, right? Obviously, yeah. the vibrations of 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 people, of, of um, in, in the mystics terms, the higher you are in the, the game, if you will, uh, you vibrate at a higher frequency. Yeah. And higher frequencies attract higher frequencies. A higher frequency does not and cannot attract a lower frequency. They repel each other as a general. It's like almost a, mag a magnetism. So that's why when you saw, when you see, you know, yogis uh, in India walking the streets, they're generally not mugged. Hmm. Um, they're generally not beaten up. That is not a thing that you hear about in India. There's other crime against other people. And this is something very interesting to me because I, again, for that year, was living in a group of people who vibrationally didn't, didn't connect with me, which were gangsters. Yeah. You know, retired gangsters, but gangsters nevertheless. <laughs> you know? So they they had a gangstery energy to them and i watched and witnessed what it was like when they interacted with people in the film industry at a high level and i was always fascinated and i've only only back and going back looking at it I go you know sometimes they mix really well <laughs> it's just scary enough it missed very well other times you could just see that when they walked in the room it just, the person just like, I can't, I can't. And we all feel that way. Sometimes you meet people and you're like, I, I, there's something, there's something wrong here. I don't feel this. This is not right. But I'd argue as well to say that you and I have gotten to this point. Our lives have brought us to this point as we're speaking right now. 10 years ago, if you would have crossed my path, it would have been a waste mm. on both parts because I wouldn't have been anywhere near the place I am right now to have an intelligent conversation about what you're talking about. You see what I mean? It wasn't the yeah. time. It wasn't the yeah. time. Just like when you meet a mate, I always tell my wife, I'm like, if we would have met in high school, you would have never gone out with me because I was a mess. And, and our energies were not anywhere near to each other because it just, we weren't. And it just was the exact timing that had to be that we met at a certain time that made sense. That's why we didn't meet a year earlier or two years earlier or five years later. It was a perfect scenario. So the vibrational aspect of things, which has been talked about in the, in the in mysticism for many, many years across multiple um, cultures throughout the world is something that's interesting on a scientific standpoint to look at mm -hmm. because of the, the likes of attracting likes mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, when certain people like you just can't get to certain people. I've had the opportunity to meet very 
famous people and worked with very famous people in my life, movie stars that you would know. And when I walk into a room with them, I sometimes I'll go, oh, I understand. I understand. There's an energy to them. They suck the energy out of the room. Everybody's attention is on them. It's a fascinating concept. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to see when you when you're talking to a movie star, a, a blockbuster movie star in their house, and you're speaking to them, and you're going, I I I feel it. I understand it. They might not be a particularly nice person or well-adjusted person. They're not better or worse, but there's that thing that they have that is built in them to get what they have in life, to, to be who they are in life. And there's something really fascinating. And then I've met, you know, very powerful people uh, in the film industry who are not behind the scenes and you just go, okay, I understand why they're able to do what they do behind the scenes. This is, I've been a character study for most of my life. I love watching characters and, and, and analyzing things. But when you throw the mystics, mysticism in it and you throw, you know, spirituality in it and you start looking at things at a different with a different lens and then you throw the science lens into it it's fascinating because it's just absolutely fascinating so that was my hypothesis i feel that you and i energetically and vibrationally are at a place where we now when we when we met we go got it we're yeah, this it's, is the it's exact a question topic. isn't it of resonance resonance thank you that's a good word no, and and it really is and i find that the the people i've got around me now that are part of my world mm -hmm. resonate with me. And we all get so excited about the ideas and we bounce ideas off each other like we're doing now. You know, there's so much I need to talk to you about, you know, when we need to have a Zoom chat. Just Absolutely. Generally. Absolutely. And you get that kind of buzz mm -hmm. and this kind of feeling almost elation when you, you have these conversations and you get so excited. And as you say, there are other people that can just drain you. Like you were oh. saying there about meeting people. I mean, I once met a, a contract killer oh, and yeah. I knew there was something straight. He had dead eyes. And, and you know, and the, you know, the way there are some people you, however hard you try, you cannot find common ground with. Correct. Oh, you know, yes. <laughs> absolutely. You know, and you go, is it me? <laughs> you know, what is it here that people just, don't get it. And they're not even interested. The kind of stuff we're interested in, the vast majority of people out there don't even, they're not even vaguely interested. You know, because, in because they're, shape. because they're too, they're, and I, I know this, and I'm sure you went through this as well, is when you are in a state of, I need to survive, a survival state and a victim, a victim state, which I was for many, many years, and that life happens to me as opposed to changing the idea of life happens for me. Yes. Which is where we are talking about as the game, as the avatar, like, okay, if I'm going through this, so now I've gotten to a point in my life when something is happening that I am not happy with, I have to stop and go, okay, why is this happening? Who, what's the point of this? Because nothing is pointless. Every single thing that happens to us in our life, there is a point to it. There, that is talked about in ancient mysticism, spirituality, and, and now in your hypothesis as well. It, everything is teaching us something. So if you stop for a second and go, okay, I've met this person who I would never meet in a million years, and he's definitely not somebody I, I would want to hang out with, but he's been put on my path. Why is he putting on my path? Is he, why is he, what is, what is he supposed to be doing for me? And I needed to learn a lesson. So that I, this happened recently. I had a, a situation where a person came into my life, short time, and I was like, mm, this isn't, this, I don't know, this is not, I'm not used to this. Why is this happening? And then it was, it forced me into a situation, which I got myself into, by the way. And when I got in there, I was like, okay, I'm here now. How can I not only, what do I need to learn here? I literally stopped and said this. I said, why, why is this happening? What am I here to learn? And when you ask those kind of questions, answers do appear in your mind. They just do. And you go, mm -hmm. oh, I'm being tested to see if I can break free from this same thing that I've been doing throughout my life. And I haven't learned the lesson yet. And in order to move over to the next level, I need to break this pattern. And, so I said, and through, and through multiple lives. Right, exactly. 
the mistakes. Exactly. Very exactly. quickly, do you know the novel The Strange Life of Ivan Asokin? I've heard of it. I don't, I, I, by I Peter Ospensky. Read, mm -hmm. read it, because that is very much the idea of even though you, you have the opportunity with knowledge to live a period of your life again, you still make the same mistakes. Oh, absolutely. And, do, you know? and, and so once I was able to break free from that, then I was like, I did what I needed to do, which was unpleasant, but I did it. And the moment I did it, I was like, Oh, I don't have to, I don't have to deal with this again. I'm, I'm good. Um, and, and I've said this so many times, and I think you could, you could back me up on this is that throughout our lives, at first, when there's a lesson to learn, especially major lesson in lives, like major things that we need to learn in this life, we get a whisper at the beginning. Mm. Then we get a poke. Yes. Then we get a tap. Until a certain point when the sledgehammer comes in. <laughs> and when the sledgehammer doesn't work, that's when the car accident comes. In. Yeah. It's the, it's, the, it's the daemon going, for God's sake, listen, you idiot. Right. right. And it gets and, more and more frustrated. Until and it, it just literally has to smack you in the face to make you wake up. Yeah. And and that has happened to us so many times. It happened to me many times in my life where I just kept making the same mistake. Like when people are like, oh, I keep dating the wrong guy. Or I keep dating the wrong girl. They just keep, I'm like, I mean, the last 10 people I've dated, they've been horrible. I'm like, maybe it's you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You're manifesting them. You know, Maybe you're... something, maybe they're being sent to you to teach you that you need to change and how you're looking at things. I always use this example. My cousin, um, when he was younger, Every time he would go to a club, he'd get into a fight. Every time he'd go to a club to dance, he would get into a massive fist fight. And he talked to me. He's like, man, I don't know what happened, man. Every single time I go out, these guys just want to start fighting me. And I got to start fighting. And I go, I hate to tell you, brother. I go to the clubs all the time. Not once. Not once have I attracted or brought that into my experience. So maybe... It could be you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's the way life is as well. I mean, when you get to my age, I look back on my life, you know, and I just think the things I did. And then I think, but I did oh. that then. And now I'm here. And I know why I got here. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, what is your definition of a good life? Being happy, contented, and being where you want to be. Never feeling that I should be somewhere else. What is your definition of God? The collective unconsciousness of all of us. And what is the ultimate purpose of life? Satisfaction. And where can people find out more about you and your books and the work that you're doing, my friend? Right. Okay. If you're interested in my books, you can, um, they're available on Amazon. They're in all formats, including uh, Audible, which I read myself, um, which my publisher was quite, I had to audition with my publisher to actually read my own books because you have to have a certain kind of tonality, Obviously. which is quite good. Um, so you can get my books. You can order them from libraries if you wish. They're all across the States. You can um, get them on Amazon. You can you can go into a bookshop. And some of them you'll actually get in bookshops as well. Um, my website website is anthonypeak.com. That's Anthony with an H and Peak, P-E-A-K-E. -E. Um, I'm very, very, very active on Facebook and Instagram. Drive people mad because I normally post about six or seven times a day um whenever i have an idea i've got to just get it there you're like a teenage girl i love it <laughs> absolutely absolutely that's what i am really i'm a teenage girl trapped inside a 68 year old man's body you know it's terrible um and uh what else yeah i also have um my own youtube channel if you just search on Anthony Peake and on there, I've interviewed a lot of um, leading edge scientists that are involved in my work as well, which will allow to get a picture of where I'm going with this. Um, so contact me, get in contact. But we, re you and I really need to have a chat anyway yes, about yes. lots of things. But whenever I do that, I always find why the hell didn't we record this? Because there was <laughs> so many great ideas came out. So next time we need to do it, probably we need a longer time maybe absolutely absolutely we will definitely and, uh, and my apologies to everybody for my sniffling and spluttering i have caught i've, I've caught uh, something when i was down in the desert in jordan last week i think it was the sand i think there was mm. so much sand around particularly when we were down in wadi rum you know doing the lawrence of arabia stuff that i've just got uh, you know clogged up a bit so my apologies about that but I appreciate uh, you coming on the show and I appreciate the work that you're doing. And I can't wait to have our, our next conversation, my friend. So be well and uh, thank you again. 
and you, Alex. Absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey and don't forget to subscribe.